Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Tourism Town Hall. My name is Corinne Clements, and I'm the CEO with the Tourism Industry Association of Prince Edward Island. TIAC's Tourism Town Hall series is an event partnership between the Tourism Industry Association of Canada, Destination Canada, and TIPI. We would also like to thank Air Canada as the sponsor for these series. The Tourism Town Hall will provide the opportunity to hear from TIAC and Destination Canada to better understand efforts being made nationally on behalf of our industry. More importantly, this session will provide an opportunity to engage on issues affecting your business and the tourism industry in our province during this time of COVID. It will also give you a chance to provide feedback on government policy for the recovery and rebuilding of our sector. Before we start, just a reminder that we will have time at the end of this session for some Q&As. If you have any questions that you have not already sent in in advance, please submit them through the Q&A interface, which you can access at the bottom of your screen. We will pick them up during the course of the presentation. Also, please note that today's session will be recorded and made available on the TIAC website. Lastly, for those that may be more fluent in French, we have sent the presentations by email in French for, your, for you to easily follow along and they will be available on the TIAC website. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which each of us call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. From Prince Edward Island, I would like to recognize that we are gathered here on the traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Our panelists today are Beth Potter, President and CEO of TIAC, and Marsha Walden, President and CEO of Destination Canada, along with myself. I'm just going to quick, quickly kick off uh, with a brief presentation from Tai Pai's perspective. Uh, I suspect I've had the opportunity and privilege to connect with most of you in the last few months. Uh, I started in this position last June, I guess in the beginning of what we hoped would be a very short pause in our industry here with the pandemic. Uh, and obviously this has been an ongoing saga for all of us and uh, we continue to work on your behalf and with you. And I wanna thank you all, first of all, for your input and engagement with Tai Pai. Uh, we, we've been, you know, proudly partnering with Tourism PEI on a number of initiatives. Uh, we have our Tai Pai training series that we kicked off uh, just a few months ago that really was to identify some training opportunities for industry that uh, we could access electronically. And uh, now we're able to move into a more hybrid event. Uh, we have our Tourism Operator Advisor Program. And this was really to identify the needs and the uh, struggles that some of our industry and our operators were having in navigating those programs uh, for supports, funding and loans, uh, whether they be provincially and federally. And to date, that position has worked individually with over 100 operators. So we're really excited to see that engagement. And I would encourage you all to reach out to our office anytime if you have questions on any of those programs. Uh, we recently brought on a new individual to join our team by way of an industry engagement and communications officer. Uh, and that was really, again, to bridge the gap. These are, these are difficult times and uh, our industry and our operators have a lot of different things going on. And we wanna be able to um, engage and communicate with you as effectively and efficiently as we can to identify gaps, challenges, and opportunities. I think um, I talk a lot about the word pivot and I tend to cringe, I think right now, uh, we talk about pivoting what our industry does and our operators and I think our industry is built on that. I think uh, a lot of our operators really are the backbone of innovation and adaptation of product and creativity. So um, I guess from a cup is half full perspective, I think um, COVID has challenged us to do more of that and moving into the future, we really want to work to help our operators uh, innovate and adapt that product so that when we are ready to open in a meaningful way, we have that world class product that uh, people have become accustomed to when visiting Prince Edward Island. We know we've seen a lot of struggles with the Atlantic bubble. Uh, our challenges are, are somewhat unique to the Atlantic region when it comes to travel, uh, certainly on Prince Edward Island with a limited population to work from for uh, 
you know, domestic travel, not even domestic travel, um, island travel, really. And uh, we've been grateful to see islanders come out and support some of our industry. But we recognize that when you go from 1.6 million visitors in a year to a population of uh, just, shy, you know, around 150,000 people, we can't, we can't survive on those numbers alone. So we continue to work and partner with, certainly with uh, the Tourism Industry Association of Canada, our counterparts in Atlantic Canada, and with all of you, our operators, to uh, advocate on behalf of our industry to find those supports and programs. Recently, we've uh, partnered with uh, a number of individuals and, and those that I just mentioned on the federal budget announcement in regards to the wage subsidy program and rent subsidy program. And I'm excited that we're starting to get some feedback from uh, the federal government and our local MPs that there is some willingness to talk about those rates and, and not seeing them decline through those summer months. So we will continue to work on your behalf on all of those pieces. The Atlantic bubble, again, that's a challenge that we will continually work with, uh, with our premier and our minister along with our Atlantic Canada counterparts. And uh, I just want to say anytime, please reach out again. We're here to work with you and for you. And thank you for your ongoing support. With that, I think we'll hand it over to Beth. Thank you, Corinne. Um, great update. And I just want to say hello and thank you to everyone else who's joining us today. Bonjour tout le monde et merci de vous joindre à nous aujourd'hui. I'm happy to be here uh, today to both update you on the work TIAC has been doing and to engage in an open dialogue about the state of the industry in PEI and across the country. Uh, Corinne acknowledged the land um, that we are on and I will just say that from coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis and First Nations people that call this land home. And we extend our respect to all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples for their valuable past and present contributions to this land. As the uh, fairly new president and CEO of the Tourism Industry Association uh, of Canada and a longtime member of Canada's tourism family, I understand how hard this past year has been and how concerned you are about the state of the industry in Canada and what the future looks like. And I'm going to talk to you today about our plans to lead Canada's tourism economy through to recovery. Now we're based in Ottawa and we take action on behalf of Canada's tourism businesses representing tourism interests at the national level. Our advocacy work involves promoting and supporting policies, programs and activities that will benefit the sector's growth and development. Our membership reflects partnerships among all sectors of the industry and provincial and territorial and regional tourism associations. We have a strong relationship with our provincial and territorial counterparts, including Taipei, with whom we work collaboratively to ensure we are aware of and can address the full range of issues facing Canadian tourism. This past year has looked a little different in terms of advocacy efforts. As your industry advocate at the national level for the past almost 14 months, we have been focused on securing support for you throughout this pandemic, ensuring you survive and successfully recover post COVID. We've been meeting with MPs and senators consistently elevating the issues impacting our industry. And most importantly, and most recently, promoting the recommendations in our 2021 tourism recovery plan in advance of last month's federal budget. We also work hard to ensure that our collective voice is heard by the public through national media coverage. This helps elevate the conversation and importance of our issues in the eyes of federal decision makers. As we are all too aware, your businesses were the first hit by the pandemic, the hardest hit by closures, and maybe the last to recover. This is the message we have been sharing with decision makers here in Ottawa and with opinion leaders across the country to ensure that supports are effectively directed to our sector. Our recovery plan was developed by our recovery committee. It has gone through a few iterations as we have navigated the crisis and we will now be looking to update this with outcomes from the recently announced proposed supports. 
Since last March, we have, been, we have seen some business programs which our industry has been able to access, such as the wage and rent subsidy programs, the rent regional relief and recovery fund, and most recently, the creation of the highly affected sectors credit availability program. TIAC works closely with departments who manage these programs to bring your concerns directly to source and ensure that issues are heard and inefficiencies are addressed. And I want to take a moment here to thank PEI members in particular who have shared your stories and concerns with us on the government support programs and issues with applying. The only way we know there are inefficiencies in programs is by hearing directly from you. So thank you for, for providing us with real life scenarios and examples. We are doing everything we can to provide you with an answer or a solution. Now on April 19th, for the first time in two years, the finance minister, Chrystia Freeland, unveiled the federal budget. Tourism was mentioned many times compared to other industries, which is an acknowledgement of the work that we've done. By highlighting our suite of sectors, the government has taken steps to recognize the value and contribution of this industry and the support required to ensure we can recover and rebuild. But what does this mean to you and your business? We were pleased to see supports in all areas of our recovery plan announced, but there is still much work to do to ensure that supports proposed actually work for our industry and to continue efforts on the pieces that were left out. There were also a number of measures in the budget that are not directly tied to tourism, but do impact our industry. Things like affordable housing, broadband infrastructure, immigration, and funding for Parks Canada. I'm going to go through a few measures that directly impact you, and we will continue to provide updates as we work through the other proposed programs with government staff. It is important to note that all of these measures must go through the normal parliamentary procedure before they are passed, and that is work where our work becomes vital. So Budget 2021 proposed a $1 billion package over three years directly for tourism. If this had been normal days, we would have been over the moon. It's not normal days, and so we're, we're really eager to understand the details of what the uh, how these that million dollars will be will be rolled out. This includes support through the regional development agencies for major festivals and events for you here in Atlantic Canada that would be through ACOA and towards a tourism relief fund to support investments by local tourism businesses in adapting to the pandemic. It also provides funding to Destination Canada to ensure Canadian destinations are top of mind for Canadians and to support destination marketing organizations to entice the return of the high value international traveler. Our main priority with this is to understand as quickly as possible how these funds will be administered so that we can share the details with you in the industry. The Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy and Rent Subsidy are very important programs to our sector and to you specifically. TIAC has been advocating to extend these programs for quite a while. The proposed extension to September is a good signal towards business support, but we know the sector will need support past this fall. And while we welcome the extension, we will continue to our work to ensure the hardest hit businesses continue to receive support at existing levels. There was also a proposal for the new Canada Recovery Hiring Program for eligible employers that continue, continue to experience declines in revenue. This initiative was proposed to help businesses hire back laid off workers or to bring on new ones. This is a program we are working through the details for to ensure that it is able to help your businesses and take into account your unique needs. We were happy to see more supports outlined for the aviation sector. We still have work to do on our specific asks, but this will help further recovery for our tourism economy overall through funding for testing infrastructure and advanced technologies. These measures will help restore Canada's, Canadians' confidence in the safety of air travel with, when public health restrictions and border measures are adjusted, which is key for domestic and international travel. Now, our biggest task going forward is going to be the labor challenge. 
We know we are one of the biggest employers of new Canadians and immigration levels are down over the last year. We were already in a labor crisis before this pandemic hit, and now we've added to that. TIAC is working closely with Tourism HR Canada to map out how we are going to best approach this, but know that this is top of mind. There were a number of significant pieces in the budget that will affect this area, and we need to ensure that these programs also account for the unique needs of the tourism industry. To help small businesses, we saw the proposal of the Canadian Digital Adoption Program to help facilitate new digital technologies and the enhancement of the Canada Small Business Financing Program. We were also pleased to see the inclusion of efforts to lower the costs of doing business by reducing credit card transaction fees. The government will work with stakeholders on consultations for this and be assured we will be at the table for those. There are numerous other items in the budget that impact our sector, and there is a lot of information, and you probably are wondering how to learn when and if these supports become available and how to access them. We will actively be sending out updates and information over the coming weeks as we learn more through our discussions with government. We know many businesses in PEI are struggling with federal support program applications and qualifications. And it is crucial that we hear from you on these issues so that we can work to address them. Tourism is the hardest hit industry. And I can tell you, when we meet the federal officials, we tell your story of losing staff, losing revenue, and worrying about how you will continue to operate. We highlight what your losses and struggles mean to the community and country in economic impact and lost jobs. You are vital and we are not taking our foot off the gas. Our main priority is you, our members, and we want you to know that we are in your corner. You have my word that we are working hard at the federal level on your behalf. You may also ask, how do we plan to move forward to regain our industry's momentum? As mentioned, our first step will be to continue advocating for those pieces that were not addressed in the budget and to ensure efficient and effective rollout of the promised support and relief programs. You need these programs to work to bridge you through. With this in mind, I'd like to take you through TIAC's vision as we move forward on a few important pieces outside of relief programs. We believe that proof of vaccination will become a common part of a traveler's travel document going forward, and we aim to lead the conversation on ensuring a national approach to this. However, we are not, we know not everyone will get vaccinated. That is why it is crucially important that we also plan for testing and processes for those that are traveling without a vaccine. Travel cannot be limited to only those who have been vaccinated. Testing and contact tracing will have to be a part of the process. So we are looking to lead the way in changing the current narrative on behalf of the sector. We need to let the public know when the restrictions are lifted that our businesses are prepared to offer experiences following all the necessary health and hygiene protocols. We know just how much work and investment you have put into ensuring your businesses are compliant and ready for guests. Consumer confidence will be vital. And while the health and safety of Canadians is paramount to our sector, we know travel will resume and are asking for the ability to plan. We have been starting conversations, recommending solutions for criteria to reopen and calling on government to take a leadership role to put a line in the sand in terms of goalposts or a target date that we can open. You will need time to plan, to market, to retool, retrain and rehire before you will be ready to open. So we have been facilitating these conversations with the Canadian government, but we've also been at the global table through the World Travel and Tourism Council we have been learning from other countries what they've been doing, and we want to ensure that Canada is part of the seamless traveler experience for people that are moving around the world as we recover from this pandemic. Now we have a national campaign coming up for Tourism Week. We've been doing this since 2003. Tourism Week is a seven day event to encourage Canada's tourism economy to recognize it and understand the impact it has on every community across the country. This year, Tourism Week is May 23rd to 30th, and
and we are calling on Canadians to take the 2021 Tourism Pledge to Travel in Canada, an invitation to come together as a country and support our local tourism destinations, businesses, and employees. We will be sharing more information on this very shortly. And finally, before I close, I encourage you to visit our site, tourismcounts.ca, where we update our advocacy initiatives and provide updates and information. And I want to thank the TIAC members, especially those of you here from PEI who are participating in today's town hall. We, agree, we greatly appreciate your continued support of our advocacy efforts and for strengthening our voice. If you are not a TIAC member, I invite you to join today. As a not-for-profit organization, our advocacy efforts rely on the support and investment of members. So please join your peers across the province and country in fueling the work we are doing today for your survival and recovery. Our success begins with you. So I'm gonna leave it there and I'm gonna hand it back to Corinne, um, but I look forward to our discussion uh, following Marcia's presentation. I'd like to welcome Marcia now. It's my pleasure to hand it off to Marcia uh, with the Des with Destination Canada. Thanks so much, Corinne. Hello, everyone. Bonjour à tous. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to join your meeting today. It's really great to be here um, speaking with our partners in Prince Edward Island. Uh, and I want you to know that I've already booked my holiday with a group of friends. So perhaps I'll be seeing some of you in late September this year. Uh, je suis très heureuse d'être ici aujourd'hui. Je vais donner cette présentation en anglais. Mais nous avons fourni le document en français aux gens intéressés. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from Vancouver the traditional home of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil I want to start today just uh, by very briefly providing you with some background information on who Destination Canada is and what our role is in the sector, since many of you may not be familiar with us. Uh, as a federal crown corporation, uh, our mandate is to work to sustain a vibrant and profitable Canadian tourism industry, which as I'm sure you can appreciate is um, an exceptional challenge at the moment. Uh, we do this through marketing, research, destination development, and by forming partnerships right across the country and across the world. Now, I know that you know that much of our industry's strength is really found in the relationships that get formed with partners. And so it is with us. Uh, Destination Canada, TIAC, and TIPI have worked together for many years to bolster our industry's prospects in um, what can only be described as perhaps the most competitive sector of all industries uh, on the globe. And as everyone knows uh, that's watching today, never before has a strong collaborative response to how we re-enter the marketplace and compete together been so very critical. Before I move on, um, I think this chart says it all. And I know this year has been incredibly difficult uh, for all of you. And I want to acknowledge that uh, harsh reality that you've faced over the last 14 months. And I also recognize that recovery is gonna be hard. And to help with that recovery, today I'm gonna touch on three phases that span three time horizons. First of all, surviving the pandemic and those related restrictions that continue to haunt us in uh, all parts of Canada, reviving market revenue and the promise of growth and opportunity that we still have in front of us in Canada, and finally thriving, ensuring that as we plan forward, we are um, making moves to increase the vitality of our industry in the long term in delivering net benefits to the communities that we work in and more long-term resilience, resilience for the businesses of our sector. So let's start with what was our very initial response to the pandemic in uh, early 2020 to help tourism uh, survive those initial devastating impacts of, of the past summer. 
We all knew that uh, travel would have to restart first at a very hyper-local level. And so in most of Canada, we did see a, a ray of hope in the summer of 2020. And so Destination Canada worked with our provincial and territorial partners to create a very agile co-op marketing approach that was able to uh, respond to the very different realities of how the pandemic was shaping up in each part of the country. And so um, uh, provided $30 million in funds uh, to our provincial and territorial partners uh, to be matched by them and um, flow into communities through uh, cities and communities. Uh, DMOs. We also invested more than $18 million in other initiatives and partnerships last year to bring, bring together some very significant players that uh, could bring huge reach to the industry and help to extend the buying power of some of our key partners across Canada. And I think it's important um, for us to also acknowledge um, the sheer speed and scale of government response at every levels to the pandemic. It's a response that I think has never before been seen in times of peace. And here are just a few of the, the uh, federal programs that have been helping tourism over the last year. And uh, there have been many at every level of government, as I said. <clears throat> So looking ahead, um, we are seeing some signals of uh, future demand. Uh, I think we all acknowledge there is pent up demand and that many of these signals are certainly pointing in a very positive direction for us and more and more clarity is being seen by the day. However, our research um, also shows that uh, not surprisingly, sentiment follows the real time health conditions in every province very, very closely. And that is why it's so critical that together as an industry, we do everything we can to restore consumer confidence in travel in the coming months. We do know that 80% of Canadians already say they plan to travel when restrictions are lifted. But Canada typically has a huge travel deficit. Canadians spend almost double on outbound travel compared to what foreign travelers will spend on inbound travel to Canada. So we need to keep Canadians dollars inside the country to help speed up our sector's recovery. In fact, we could speed it up by a full year simply by having an excellent summer this year. So the initiatives we saw Beth just referenced about traveling in Canada this summer are critically important. And Destination Canada's short-term marketing plans are really designed to channel domestic demand to destinations right across the country. A key part of our plan to revive revenue um, is this multi-phased um, sort of simplified approach that you see here that helps to align our messaging with the evolution of health restrictions. As you can appreciate, we can't get out in front of what is um, permissible from a health regulation point of view. So right now we're in the influence stage. And during this stage, we have a few key things that we're trying to impart. First of all, we need to uh, help Canadians better understand the importance of supporting Canada's tourism industry. We need to inspire confidence in traveling domestically. And we need to reignite that welcoming spirit of Canadian communities to ensure that they really feel ready to welcome visitors back. And we've seen evidence to the contrary um, in this past year in many forms. So as conditions improve, of course, we'll continue to introduce more and more aggressive calls to action that will inspire Canadians to plan and book their travel uh, for this summer and beyond. And in the months ahead, as we do start to see people begin to travel again, it's so important that all of us amplify that peer-to-peer -peer social sharing of those early travelers because more than anything else seeing other people travel will inspire more people to travel we know that word of mouth, mouth is the most powerful tool we have in our marketing kit and um, uh, seeing your friends family and colleagues traveling will inspire confidence in you here are a few examples of our work that are uh, specific to pei uh, in the center of the screen, as soon as we see the next slide, there we are, uh, you may recognize Captain Perry Gotell of Tranquility Cove Adventure in Georgetown. Now, 
Captain Perry shared with us that um, how his community has really built an incredibly special place. And despite the losses that have been experienced, everyone is hanging on. And he noted that we really have learned something this past year, and that is how much we need each other now more than ever. And there's a sentiment I think we can all appreciate. So even though our short-term work is very much focused on domestic travel, we are continuing to till the soil in international markets. So we've been working um, uh, over this uh, past year very closely with our in-market teams around the world to ensure that Canada is staying top of mind uh, with consumers and um, importantly, maintaining those critical um, global travel trade and travel media relationships that will help um, kickstart uh, the restart. And one example of that work you can see here on the screen, uh, which is um, a magazine called Boundless that is published by Virtuoso. It's very high impact, focused on high value travelers. And this, uh, these issues are entirely focused on travel ideas in Canada, including in PEI, as you can see. So what is it really going to take though in that third aspect of, of looking ahead in helping our visitor economy across Canada to thrive? Well, we believe it begins with a new North Star, one that orients us perhaps more towards why our corporation was created uh, in the first place. Our aspiration is to really allow tourism to enhance the quality of life of all Canadians and to enrich the lives of visitors while they're with us. We also are here to enable Canadian culture to thrive and for place-based regenerative economies to emerge as we rebuild our industry. And we'll be working very collaboratively with organizations right across the country, including all of you here today, uh, in doing these things to help elevate Canada's competitiveness as a tourism destination in the future. So to come on that journey with us, let's please stay connected. Uh, you can see some of the ways to stay in touch with us on the screen right now. Je vous encourage à rester connecté avec nous sur nos canaux de, communica de communication. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. And I'll now pass it back to Corinne for some Q&A with everyone. Thanks very much, Marcia. As we mentioned at the start of the session, this town hall was developed for you to ask questions to our industry leaders on issues affecting business and the tourism industry. I do believe we had some questions submitted in advance and please continue to put them into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'll ask that the panelists keep the responses short probably need to tell myself that more than the two of you. Um, and we'll get through as many of those questions as we can. So to start the conversation, let's be begin with some of those questions that were submitted in advance. Uh, I think we'll start maybe with you, Beth, if that's all right. The first question is, when it comes to reopening tourism, whenever it is safe to do so, what would you estimate your manageable scale is without overwhelming local communities with the influx of tourists? Um, okay, so I think we've got to kind of take a, a, an approach to this that we're, we're going to be scaling up. Um, we know that local first, you know, regional uh, Canadian travelers are going to be our first guests, among our first guests, and then um, we'll start to see um, uh, international Amer and, and, and American guests come when we can see the borders open up. Um, one of the things that we know that we're going to have to work on collectively as an industry is making sure that the residents um, feel comfortable welcoming people back. And so that's one of the reasons why um, we want, you know, industry to be talking about all of the things that they're doing to provide that, you know, that health um, and, and hygienic environment to talk about the things that they've done to make sure that not only their guests will be safe, but their employees are safe too, because those employees go back into the community and we want the community, everyone in, in the local communities to know that, that the industry is very, very concerned and taking taking serious, paying serious attention um, to these protocols to make sure that 
that we can welcome uh, guests to our region without, um, with, 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 you know, reducing the risk of, of virus mitigation. Thank you. Uh, Marsha, what would your, your expectations or thoughts, I guess, be with respect to interprovincial travel? Um, intra-provincial or inter-provincial? Intra. Intra, intra. Well, I think we probably all realize that, as Beth was just saying, um, you know, reopening uh, the tourism economy is going to start at a fairly hyper-local level and expand from there. It's unlikely, in my view, that the international border would open before the inter-provincial borders do. And many of the provinces are really focused on trying to encourage travel within their own provinces this year or within a smaller travel bubble. So I think we'll see a gradual ripple effect, if you will, from those initial rocks dropped in the pond. Um, the circle will widen and widen until we're able to um, envelop the whole world. Uh, but we are also seeing some very different um, sentiments around that across the, across the country. So we track Canadian sentiments every week and we can see these go up and down with health conditions, as I mentioned in my presentation. But there are also some very regional differences. So, for instance, Alberta, uh, Albertans and um, Quebecois are far more willing to welcome people from other communities and other provinces into their regions than, let's say, British Columbians or um, those in the Maritimes. So it's... Um, uh, it, it's very specific to regions, how these sentiments are unfolding. And I'm sure that uh, local politicians and provincial uh, premiers will respond to those local sentiments. Um, uh, so it's hard to say right across Canada how I think intra-provincial travel will unfold. I think it will very much follow the, the um, regional health authorities and premiers leads. Thank you. I might just add to uh, Beth's responses on that first question in regards to the manageable scale for reopening when it is safe to do so. I think uh, to your point, Marcia, it has been very regional and how, uh, and even provincial really in regards to some of our restrictions and capacities. And I know from an Atlantic Canada perspective, uh, certainly Prince Edward Island, we have been asking our government and our Atlantic Canada counterparts to talk about some consistencies with those restrictions and capacities to simplify things for our visitors when they do start to travel. And I think, you know, we everything starts at home. So there's an, an educational component, certainly, that uh, we've been talking about with our members and uh, our government counterparts on educating islanders really on the safety factors and the enhanced protocols that we have in place to ensure that we're doing everything we can to protect uh, not just our visitors, but our, you know, our employees, our communities. So that for me is really where we've started here locally. And I think uh, as we continue to move out, we want to work with uh, both levels of government on what those benchmarks are, what those timeframes are, and what the expectations can be for our operators so that we can plan and understand what maybe capacities are. And uh, you know, no one, no one knows their own business better than themselves, but I think that's where the collaboration between uh, certainly all of us and uh, the various levels of government to really uh, map out that framework on what it is as we open up further and further, you know, and uh, certainly look forward to getting those international borders open. Beth, I'll ask you another one here. Um, are there funding opportunities for those that fall between the cracks of other government funding models, especially for those who are planning to open this season? Um, I, I guess they're probably referring to those federal funding programs. Right, so, um, um, so the, the Canadian hiring credit, um, which um, was part of the budget, um, will be available um, starting in July. Um, it's a short, um, time frame that it will be available. I believe it's July to November. Um, and so, and as soon as we have more details on how and when you can apply for that, we will make sure that uh, we share them and we'll share them through, through Taipei as well. Um, and then um, the Regional Recovery and Relief Fund is still available through ACOA as it, and then coming is this tourism relief fund. And we are in conversations right now with government officials as to 
what that's going to look like. Um, and so, um, you know, if, if you have um, ideas, and I'm, I'm addressing this to, to everyone on the call today, that if you've got ideas on how you might like to see that program roll out, um, you know, please feel free to, uh, to reach out to, to Corinne or to myself um, and, and share your ideas. And um, now is the time because this is when uh, the work is being done to put that, to put the, the, the framework around that program. Marcia, when there are huge influxes of cases being reported across the country, what are Canadian consumer attitudes towards tourism during these times? What are the trends for the recovery rate of consumer confidence each time there are new restrictions in place or closures? Mm -hmm. um, well, just as I was just referencing, um, and I can quote a few uh, statistics, but not a lot uh, from memory. Uh, I, I did reference that um, Albertans and uh, Quebecois are most inclined to want to welcome visitors from other communities and other provinces into, into their province. And that currently is uh, sitting around 42, 43%. So it's not strong. Um, whereas when we look at British Columbia and the Atlantic provinces, um, that's more in the low 20% feel ready to welcome. So again, not a great, uh, not a great number. Um, but I think we can all be hopeful that as health conditions improve, those numbers rise and fall with um, the realities of, of what they're seeing. And so we are hopeful that if things start to open up and people feel more comfortable going out to restaurants again and, and just being more social, uh, that that will also translate well into tourism. But um, right now we have a lot of work to do. And so all of the things that Beth was um, referencing in terms of building confidence, you know, having that hygiene theater uh, going on visible to everyone uh, as you, um, we used to hide all those things in the night shift kind of thing, but now make it visible, build confidence, showcase people that are in your establishments and, uh, and enjoying themselves and uh, ensure that your community knows that you feel ready to welcome people with all the right uh, things in place and um, you'll, you'll bring your community along with you. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to circle back to Beth's question again uh, on the funding opportunities and for operators who have fallen between the cracks. Uh, I think I referenced earlier our tourism operator advisor position that we have uh, in our office, and that's a relatively new position. It's been, I'm going to say, three weeks maybe since Kirk joined our team. And uh, I think it's probably not unique to Prince Edward Island, but there we have so many small operators and uh, we see the challenges and the struggles on navigating those programs and understanding the programs and eligibility. And, uh, you know, our province here, the Department of Tourism did do a gap analysis on those funding programs. So if you find yourself, uh, I guess, lost for where you might fit in those programs or challenges, I would certainly encourage you to reach out to our office. And uh, Kirk is in constant communication with both levels of government, uh, with our local CBDC offices to help navigate those programs for all of those operators. I think we have one question in the chat here. Uh, this would be, I'm going to say for you, Beth, um, says the concerns of the cruise industry, they were not included in TIAC's original recovery plan. What are you planning to do going forward regarding the reopening of cruise and supporting that industry? So, um, uh, I can't speak for uh, my predecessor, but um, we have now, uh, we've certainly engaged the cruise industry um, in the last couple of months. Um, we are launching a national cruise committee uh, to provide input uh, into the recovery document um, and you know, recommendations going forward, understanding that they fall outside of the rest of the um, of the, you know, our suite of sectors being that Transport Canada has put a halt on cruising at least until next spring. So we want to make sure that we um, represent them uh, and that we um, get, get them the support that they are going to need in order to remain viable um, ahead of next, of next cruise season. 
Um, and so that's what we, you know, that's what we've done. We've engaged with them and, um, and we will continue to do that. And we're, we're you know, I've heard from other sector groups um, as well since I started and, um, and we are, we're just opening, we're opening the, the channels of communication and we're inviting all of our members, um, all sectors. If you don't see yourself in the work that we're doing, um, you know, I'm, I'm ready to reach out to you. You reach out to me, and let's uh, let's find a way forward together. That's great, Beth. And for uh, I think most of most of the registrants joining us today, my background uh, was in cruise, so I can understand uh, the struggles in that industry specifically. And I think it's important to talk a little bit about. Um, I'm off script right now. Uh, a little bit about the supply chain. I think. Um, and the education of what that supply chain, not just for cruise is, but for many of our sectors of tourism and the impacts that that, that has. And we've been talking about that locally here, um, the impact on fisheries, agriculture, uh, restaurants aren't as busy, they don't need as much product. So I think it's important that we continue that dialogue on the su supply chain and the impacts that that does have. Uh, cruise is a perfect example of that. We have uh, so many different businesses that would be impacted by uh, the halt of that business. So uh, we certainly would encourage, again, all of our operators locally to reach out to us and, uh, and communicate the challenges and struggles so that we can help to uh, funnel that information up to TIAC. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we do know how hard it is. I mean, we've, we've been, you know, I have been talking to tourism operators throughout this pandemic. I have talked to thousands and thousands of businesses across the country um, of all different shapes and sizes. And I, I've heard exactly how um, the restrictions, the closed border, um, the, the lack of, um, you know, the, the, the inability to, to access um, some of the funding available. I've heard that, I've heard the stories and I, we have been working constantly. Every time something comes up, anytime somebody tells us something new that has not been uh, shared yet, that we haven't been able to, that we haven't had to go and find a resolution for, we've been taking that forward and we will continue to do that. And so um, as I, uh, and, you know, part of my plan, get my feet wet, um, in the, you know, going coast to coast to coast here virtually, um, I want to hear from everyone and I, and I, and I'm, and I'll tell you right now, PEI is the top of my list when I'm coming, when we can start traveling again, I'm going to be heading your way, so watch out. <laughs> we look forward to it. Uh, I just want to circle back a little bit again on, on Marsha's comments earlier on the consumer confidence. Um, I think we, we feel the resident confidence uh, in Atlanta, Canada. I think it, we're acutely aware of how lucky we have been throughout this pandemic when it comes to case counts. Uh, but that does become a bit of a challenge uh, when it comes to the idea of being open and willing to welcome visitors again. Uh, that is something that we continue to work on and we continue to encourage uh, government officials to, to change the dialogue a little bit on messaging because it does directly impact um, the choices that people are making, whether or not they're planning vacations um, or canceling. We've seen, you know, we've seen restrictions or case counts come up and we've had direct cancellations for some of our operators. So we will continue to encourage, uh, I think the, the dialogue to change somewhat on when we can travel, our plan to travel, what those benchmarks are to get reopen and the road to recovery. I think we've seen some really encouraging um, information come out just in the last 10 days or so, Corinne, um, the uh, National Health Authority, uh, Dr. Tam, uh, released some milestones, I would say, about what it's going to take for, uh, for freedom to, uh, to return this summer. And the two milestones that she called out were 75% um, of Canadian adults uh, need to have a first dose and 20% of adults need to have their second dose. And then, you know, sometime after that, four weeks or so, she could see a border reopening. So the modeling that Destination Canada did, and you can't quote me on this because all kinds of stuff can change in between. And I, you know, I do not have the authority to make these decisions, uh, but we of course are modeling against information like that to figure out, okay, what might a likely timing then turn into? 
And so the modeling we've done says that we could reach that first milestone um, in about mid-June and the second milestone about July 24th which would mean the potential for a uh, border opening in, um, in the latter part of summer. So first week of September or so. Um, so that's some of the best information we have right now. Um, yesterday, the province of Saskatchewan Premier released a framework with um, milestones as well. And while there's no dates, firm dates attached to those, it does give kind of the period between those milestones where they can adjust and reassess them. Those are the things I think that will build confidence mm -hmm. in amongst Canadians. And um, when our health authorities say it's safe uh, for us to move about again, um, then, and those restrictions start to be lifted, then uh, Canadians, I think, will embrace that. They're, they're eager for it. I am. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. <laughs> we did have another question just come in, um, and this is probably for you, Beth. Um, the question is, will you be looking at a travel passport that says the traveler is vaccinated? I feel like that might be a, a good question for you, given some recent discussions we've had. Right, so um, we are absolutely encouraging that Canada line up with um, a global system so that um, we can have one version of a, some people are calling it a vaccine passport, I've, I've been calling it proof of vaccination, but we are we're, we want to line up with what's happening so that from a, around the world, so that from a traveler's perspective, it's a seamless experience. We want everybody to understand what they have to do. And we don't want them to have to think, oh, well, if I'm going from PEI to Ontario, what do I have to do? Or if I'm going from Canada to the United States, what do I have to do? If I'm going to Europe, is it something different? We want a system. We want to be a part of a system that is, um, uh, that's got continuity to it around the globe. Um, and, and that's what we're recommending. Um, at the same time, I will say that we are also recommending that um, Canada, again, in line with what is happening in other countries, really look at how non-vaccinated people can travel, um, whether it's you know, PCR tests before they leave, rapid tests on arrival, um, but trying to, to get a testing regime in place that will not automatically require quarantine um, because that that is the only way that we're going to see um, business and, and leisure travel come back at the rates that we want want and need them to come back at. I'll, I'll just um, build on that for a moment if I could, Beth. Uh, those are important considerations when we look at the sentiments of Americans around vaccination. So in Canada, about 80% of us say that we will be vaccinated, 80% uh, of adults. Whereas amongst Americans, that uptake rate is more like 63%. So, you know, 40% of a marketplace not being willing um, to uh, take vaccines is um, a, a significant consideration when we consider travel capacity and, um, and what might transpire for us as their biggest travel market. Thank you. Um, this, maybe Marsha, I'll put this question to you that just came in, uh, and, and Beth, maybe you can follow up with Marsha. Are we concerned about missing our window for business events due to the slower rollout of vaccine compared to our U.S. neighbours? Well, of course we're concerned. Um, you know, we want to be at the head of the pack. We don't want to be trailing, um, uh, trailing particularly a key competitor like the U.S., um, there is a prevailing sentiment in the business community in the U.S. Um, to be booking within the U.S. at the moment. But I will say we've been extremely active in cultivating uh, business event activity, and we are starting to see um, good signs of uptick. Uh, I think if you go on our corporate website, you'll see some of the most recent information that we have about the rate of cancellation and rebooking, the rate of new bookings. Um, and, and they're pretty promising, though still low, but they're all heading in the right direction, which is great. And aside from the major business events, the return of um, business meetings 
is expected to really um, follow along the rate of vaccination uptake. So um, we're feeling you know, reasonably confident there, but obviously we'd like to be ahead of the US, not behind them. And it, I will say that um, you know there's an off there's going to be an awful lot of effort behind that to to really see the business meetings and business events come back, um, because right now our downtown cores need that business. Um, we need to see people back to work. We need to see people back to meeting face to face um, in order for our urban centers across the country um, to start to to come back from this pandemic. Um, you know, this has been a situation where we've seen rural uh, do uh, better than, than uh, they have in the past, uh, and they're certainly doing a lot better than urban centers. So it's going to be really important that, um, that this is a, uh, a, just a groundswell effort um, to, to get business events and, and meetings back. Mm -hmm. I can just add to that too. I think um, this kind of circles back to my supply chain comment earlier. And one of the biggest things that we've been talking about locally here is we know there will be that pent up demand. We hear that, um, but we need to ensure that we have that capital infrastructure investment. And a lot of our operators don't have the revenues uh, and, the, and the money in the bank to reinvest. So that's something that we've been talking about a lot locally is not only do we need to support those operators to get them through, but we need to be able to ensure that we have a product that is uh, exceptional when visitors do return and when those meetings and conventions to, do return. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, we've officially run out of time. I do wanna thank everyone for joining us on the town hall and submitting the questions today. Uh, if you didn't have any questions answered live, please send them to the panel uh, and we will respond by email. I wanna thank Beth certainly and Marsha for your time today. This has been great to have uh, a Prince Edward Island lens to the discussion and uh, your counterparts at Tayak uh, have done a great job putting this together, Beth and Destination Canada too. So thank you and thank you to our participants. Thank, thank you. you. See you in September. Oh, wait. <laughs>